Ron grunted in his sleep. Hi guys, Veggie Gamer back and we're back to doing the book reviews for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone Veggie Knights. This is chapter 10 until 12 Veggie Knights. Action-packed ones, guys. A lot going on in these ones. I, I, the, the thing is, I've thoroughly enjoyed this book so far, but these chapters are really quite excellent. Some things very well done in the movies. Some things very different in the books. We'll be going into Hermione and her old situation, which is very, very different in the books, guys. But I'm absolutely adoring it, though. It really is so much fun in experiencing uh, this story again if, via the books. And yeah, thank you so much for the support and the feedback that we've had so far on them, guys. One bit of feedback is that people have been saying that apparently Voldemort, which is what um, Jim Dale reads Voldemort as, was the original pronunciation was meant to be, or at least it's meant to be French for Flight of Death or something like, oh no, I think, I think that's right. If I'm wrong, I'm so sorry, but it's something like that in French. And so that's why he's saying Voldemort, which is very interesting, guys. Again, it's just like a nice way of experiencing th this books, these books in like these uh, this story, sorry, in, the, in this different way. But as always, I am listening to the Jim Dale and the Stephen Fry, Fry versions, uh, and I'll be giving my thoughts on all those. I think there is a misread line at some point from Jim Dale in, in these chapters, guys. But but we'll, we'll, we'll be covering that. These book reviews are appearing on the Patreon first of all, guys. And so if you're watching this on a YouTube video. Uh, our YouTube channel, there will be more of uh, instantly available to you if you want to go back uh, back the Patreon. You don't have to, of course, guys. You can just wait on the channel and they will eventually be appearing. I do intend at some point to get these out weekly, but at the moment it has been quite tough for me. But yes, there will be currently more of more um, of these on the Patreon if you want to go and back it. There's no minimum amount that uh, for, for pledging, guys. You can pledge a small amount as you want, and then you can check check them out. Or like I say, you can just wait until these come out. On the YouTube channel, one other perk from doing the uh, the Patreon guys is that uh, I post a blog on there uh, before I put these video out, saying, "Hey, if you've got any thoughts or notes or any opinions or questions about these chapters that we're co covering in this video, let me know beneath, and uh, we'll cover them at the end of the video." And so, at the end of this video, I will be going through uh, your questions and your thoughts and everything. And yeah, it worked out really well last time. We had like a really good discussion and so I can't wait to see what you guys have been saying in fact I got to say I don't read them beforehand but I did notice someone left a comment about the line about Ron grunting and everything and that's why I did the intro just now because quite frankly if that person hadn't mentioned that that in in the comments I wouldn't have even noticed it <laughs> either way let's get on with these chapters we'll start off with chapter 10 Halloween uh, the day after the free-headed dog incident, Draco is surprised to see Ron and Harry haven't been expelled from Hogwarts. Hermione is no longer talking with them, to their delight. A week later, some, uh, everyone is surprised to see Harry receiving a large parcel in the mail with a note from McGonagall t telling him to keep the new Nimbus 2000 a secret. After Ron instantly tells Draco about it when confronted, Malfoy uh, tries to dob in Harry. I don't know if that's a term outside the UK. You know, grass, so, uh, grass, uh, grassing someone is probably a UK term. To tell on someone. That's what I mean by dobbing Harry in. It's not uh, nothing to do with Dobby. Or maybe it is. Um, and, and is, oh yeah, so um, Malfoy tries to dob in Harry and is shocked to hear Professor Flitwick knows all about the special circumstances. Harry enters the Quidditch field for the first time and tries the Nimbus, um, uh, Nimbus 2000 out was uh, until Woods arrives. Wood goes through the details and the roles involved in Quidditch. Fast forward to Halloween, the students uh, uh, have a go at making feathers fly in uh, Professor Flitwick's child's lesson. Uh, Ron and Hermione are unhappy to be put together and Hermione frustratingly tells Ron he is doing it wrong. After being challenged to do it back, she is able to do make the f uh, feather float first time. After the lesson, she overhears Ron telling Harry no wonder no one likes her and isn't seen in classes for the rest of the day. That evening, there is a Halloween feast. Ron and uh, Harry overhear Pravati telling Lavender that uh, Hermione has locked herself in the bathroom and won't come out. Quirrell suddenly bursts into the Great Hall, panicked about a troll that is roaming the dungeon. As the students are led back to their houses, Harry suddenly remembers Hermione is alone down there, and they rush uh, their way to the dungeon. They're surprised to notice Snape heading to the third floor instead, instead of towards the troll's location. 
They find the hideous troll and successfully lock it in a room. While celebrating, they suddenly hear Hermione screaming, screaming in the room, and they rush back to, to find her cowering in front of the troll. They are able to distract it before Harry leaped onto its back and accidentally shoved his wand into its nose. Ron's, uh, Ron panics and takes out his wand and says the first spell that they can think of, making the troll's club start to fly above its head and falling down onto it, knocking it out. McGonagall, Snape and Quirrell burst into the room. Hermione takes the blame and says that she tried to deal with the troll herself and Ron Ham and uh, Harry saved her. McGonagall takes five points off her and gives five points each to Ron and Harry. Love this in the books, guys. Lots of different things going on, which we will go through in my notes. But this was like a really lovely, lovely, I mean, a lot going on. So one nice thing is that uh, after the initial terror of uh, seeing Fluffy or the three-headed dog as they know it at this point, uh, a couple of days later, Harry and Ron are like kind of like bigging up, like for thinking that is like a really exciting adventure and it's like saying they can't wait to experience more stuff like that despite the fact that they were absolutely terrified at the time uh yeah hermione's no longer talking to them which um i don't think was a i'm pretty sure that wasn't a thing that was made clear in the in in the movies but yeah they refer to her as a, a bossy know-it-all i got to say guys i mean hermione is so different in 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 the book she, she is the character so far of everyone who i feel um is a standout at being different, particularly at the end of this chapter, but we'll get through my notes in order. Um, yeah, the, the, the Draco, I mentioned it in the last uh, video, guys. Harry, particularly Harry, Ron as well, but particularly Harry really has... He hates Draco. Sure, Draco hates him back as well. But in the movie, it's like Draco is only ever mentioned when he's there doing something, you know? Whereas in the book... Harry most of the time is thinking about Draco and like thinking about ways of getting revenge on him, like trying to embarrass him and so on. It's it's uh, Harry. I feel like is is a lot more of a real character in this. He's not just like the good guy who you know bad guys do bad things too. He's also thinking bad things about the bad guys as well. And so I I really like that. I really do um think it's great. He's also very sarcastic to, with Draco as well. When um, Professor Flitwick says to Draco, oh yes, I've heard about the special circumstances, which it will allow Harry as a first year to have a broom. And Draco's like shook. And like Harry says something like, yeah, well, I, I, I should really thank Draco because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be getting it. He's rubbing it in there, guys. And I really like that. I really like that Harry... I, I mentioned how Draco is living rent-free in his head in the last, uh, last book review. And that really is the case, guys. And I think it adds so much to Harry. I think it was in Prisoner of, A Prisoner of Azkaban in my movie reactions. Whereas, yeah, it was. When, when I actually notably said, I never really felt, thought about the fact that Harry would have this real personality and like this uh, be a complicated character. Because up to that point in the movie, he's, he's kind of... A blank canvas in a, in in a good way, guys. In a lot of you know, in a lot of protagonists in in movies and in stories and everything, can be quite bland. But in the books, you get so much more detail about you know, what's going on in his head. And he really hates has it. He, he really hates Draco. He really does. So yes, Draco confronts them again, which happens a lot in these books. I've now <laughs> realised it's like oh, Harry and Ron are doing something, and then Draco comes along with Cram and Goyle. R.I.P. Goyle. My God, I still can't get over that. Um, uh, they mentioned that uh, Draco has a Comet 260, which is a pretty cool... Apparently, it's a pretty cool name for a, for a broom, but apparently it costs a lot more than what it's worth. It's not actually that good a broom. It just costs a lot, which I'm sure is the case with a lot of cars and things like that, which I think was probably what they're going for. So now we go over to the Quidditch rules, guys. And i got to say, I really, I, I felt this really helped. Because in the movies, it's really kind of glossed over. In my opinion, anyway. And also, Wood just straight up says some things incorrectly, guys. But anyway, ha Harry goes to the stadium and, and waits for Wood, which is actually really nice. I feel like that would have been a nice moment for, like, Harry to, like, enter this stadium for the first time. And just be like, wow, this is amazing. And then Wood's to come in afterwards. But no, in the movie, they come in at the same time. Uh, Wood goes through through the the, the rules how uh, beaters are beaters are, are offense and defense, which in the movie I felt like they're always just 
offense in the way as they're trying to hurt the other the other team. They're actually trying to help help their team as well. Like particularly with uh, with the seeker, they are like defending the seeker away from the other team's attacks and also the the, the other balls and so on. Lovely bit of detail there. The line which absolutely confused me and my first movie reaction had a lot of comments explaining the rules of the snitch and in the movie wood says if you catch this potter we win now that isn't true guys uh, you know most of the time it is true but um in the book he, he says um the, the team that that win grabs the snitch nearly always wins um that, yeah, this is something which at first really did confuse me, and so it's nice to see so much uh, detail and it being explained over a long, you know, not being rushed, because obviously in the movies you need to get to the action, you can't be hanging around explaining the rules of like a fake sport for too long. He does say that no one's died at Hogwarts, and as I remember, uh, Fred did say that uh, in, in the movie he says to uh, Harry, um, that no one's died for years. Now that could be one of two things. That could be that Fred is like saying um, no one's died in the sport for years. What I'd imagine it probably is is Fred is winding Harry up, saying, "Yeah, no one's died here for years." Whereas in reality, no one's actually ever died at Hogwarts. Obviously, Harry very nearly did in in Prison of Azkaban, didn't he? But um, but yes, apparently up to this point, no one's ever actually died at Hogwarts from it, during a Quidditch match, which Watching it blooming amazes me, but yes. Apparently the longest game that, that's got on was a three month game, which is ridiculous. I do feel like people have mentioned that before, but yes, apparently the longest game. I'm not sure if it's the longest game of Hogwarts or the longest game in the sports record record. So you would imagine it's probably the sports record, but um Yeah, three months is just ridiculous. Yeah, so yeah, the, the, the rules are a lot better described in this. Uh, there's one bit where uh, when uh, Wood is explaining how the goals work and to how you need to get the ball through it and everything, and and Harry is like, um, oh, like basketball, and Wood's like, well, what's basketball? Obviously, he's he's um, he's a purebred uh, wizard, you, you'd imagine. Although interestingly enough, he does have golf balls because they, they they say they can't use the snitch at that time because it's getting a bit dark. And so, uh, and they might just fly off and they'll, and they'll lose it. And so instead they use golf balls. Now I'm thinking that maybe, at least in the movie, Woods had a Scottish accent. He doesn't, uh, I mean, in, in Jim Dale and Stephen Fry version, he's just got an English accent. But maybe because golf is such a big thing in Scotland and basketball isn't really that bigger thing outside of schools in the UK. I don't know. It just seems odd that Wood has golf balls to use instead of the snitch, but has never even heard of basketball. We get another mention of Charlie, guys. It's really nice in these books to have so much detail about the Weasleys. Seriously, it's almost like that they're the main focus of the books at this point. I'm absolutely loving it. We hear about how Charlie could have actually played for England if he hadn't gone off to um, to train dragons like, like he did. Uh, so yeah, going over to uh, Professor Flitwick's charms class, he tells uh, the tale of Wizard <laughs> Wizard Barufio. Who apparently you know, miss said a spell once and spawned a, a buffalo onto his chest. Now I'm wondering if this is a fictional character. Much like we had, what was it? Rabbity rabbits or something that Ron's going on about. Um, and like Hermione and Harry like, look at him like, what the hell are you talking about? In uh, Definitely Hollis Part 1. I'm wondering if Wizard Barufio is maybe like a... Uh, a, 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 a fictional character in a book that you know young wizards and witches find out about when they're very young you know knowing the date learning the dangers of you know what they're going to be uh, learning in the future I, th I thought that was um, a nice little detail uh, Seamus only sets fire to his feather and I think that at this point I could be wrong because it has been a while since I said Philosopher's Stone um, we also didn't get the scene where he's trying to turn water into rum and it blows up in his face. And so at this point at least, Seamus has not blown himself up yet. He only sets fire to it. And so maybe that was something which is added for the movies. I mean, it, it works. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Obviously, it pays off in Deathly Hallows Part 2 as well. Wonderfully. But um, yeah, he hasn't done that yet. So now we're jumping over to the, uh, the Halloween feast, guys. And yeah, it's actually Harry who overhears... Pravati telling Lavender 
about Hermione locking herself in a bathroom. So Neville's not involved in this. Obviously in the movie it's actually Neville who says, well I thought he said fatty, but he tells Harry and Ron that, uh, that, that apparently, according to Pravati, um, Hermione's done this. Whereas it, it, in the book, it's literally down to chance that Harry overhears Pravati telling Lambda. Thank goodness he did, because obviously what happens, happens. But So then uh, Quirrell obviously bursts in uh, and tells Dumbledore about the, uh, about the trial. I don't think he screams so much in the books. He just goes in and tells Dumbledore audibly instead of actually screaming it like, you know... Or maybe he does. I'm, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it was probably a little bit different in the book. And we hear more about Percy, guys. Obviously, that each house is being led back to, to, to their, their quarters and everything. And Percy, it, you really do get this idea of him being a rule, rule follower. And as long as you follow rules, everything will be okay. He literally says, there's no need to fear the troll if you follow my orders. It's just such a, such a Percy thing. And I wish that we'd seen more of this side of Percy. Like I say, I think I said it in the previous book review. It's like one line in Prisoner of Azkaban when he's trying to get to the fat lady painting, which has been uh, uh, attacked, and um, and he's and he's like, move aside, I'm the head boy, and I'm really making himself seem important. I mean, that might even be the last line that he says because obviously we see him uh, in Order of the Phoenix and in Deathly Hallows Part Two, but I don't think he says a single word in those, and so. It's really nice to have so much with, the, the, you know, hearing about Charlie again, and you know Percy, and like you know the the, the, the twins and everything. It really adds to the characters. I mean, it, Percy is in these chapters a lot, in in fact, and so I do wish that he was more, more like that in the books, because you really get a sense of his personality this early on. Uh, so yeah, um, Ron actually speculates that maybe it was Peeves who let the troll in as a joke. Peeves getting a lot of mentions again, guys. It's it's interesting because reading these books for the first time, I, I'd imagine a lot of you must have been thinking, "Ah, oh, Peeves is going to be really, really crucial down the line," and maybe he will be. Maybe maybe the movies change around things so so they cut him out altogether, but he would have been significant. But he keeps on getting mentioned, guys, which which I'm I'm loving. He, there's no actual Peeves. In these chapters, I don't think, but yeah, we do we do get a couple of mentions of him. I didn't appreciate the line because when Harry and Ron are like going off to try and um, go and uh, help Hermione, it, it says that they, they scurried past a group of confused Hufflepuffs. We're not confused. We're just playing it cool, okay? It's very interesting how in the movie. We get like one shot of Snape backing out of the Great Hall when we hear about the troll. But in in the in in the book, uh, Harry and Ron actually see him heading to the third floor, which is completely different, guys. Because obviously, Ron and uh, Harry in the movies don't see Snape backing out. We as the audience do. Whereas in the book, as they're heading towards the dungeons, they see Snape going the opposite direction of thinking, "Well, what's he doing? He's heading towards the third floor instead of going to confront the troll." So yeah, a very, very different there. And obviously adds to the, to the suspicion of what he's really up to. Uh, they actually smell the troll when they're getting close to it. They, they actually could actually smell it coming, which is just disgusting. I think it says it like smells of old socks and stuff. And yes, they actually lock the troll in the room with Hermione, which is freaking hilarious. I guess I can I, I can kind of understand why that wouldn't have been in the in the movie um, to make Ron and uh, Harry see more her heroic. Whereas it's very possible that the troll could have just left the room again, and Hermione would have been absolutely fine. In fact, we actually get the line later on, uh, which is different from the extended version, where um, where. Harry says to Ron, well, she may not have needed saving if we hadn't locked the thing in there with her. Now, in the extended edition of uh, Philosopher's Stone, we have the line, she may not have needed saving if you hadn't insulted her. And we'll get on to that, guys, because this the end of the chapter is actually completely different from the books. From, from the movie, sorry. Um, and I think I actually prefer the book. I, I, actually, I, I actually really do, but let's get through this. Uh, Hermione uh, doesn't prompt Ron to, to use the spell. Yes, that's very true. Now, the, uh, the the spell which Ron uses is obviously the spell which Hermione had berated him about in the charms class earlier that day, and it was the first thing that Ron uh, Ron thought of when, when, um, when you know, panicking to try and save Harry from the troll. Which is very interesting because obviously in the movie it's Hermione who tells Ron again how to do it 
correctly and then Ron does it. Now that's really nice because it is like the three of them working together to overcome the troll, which I do really like in the movie, but it, in the book it really is Hermione. It, Hermione is just frozen and is basically not able to move an inch with, with this troll in front of her. So the fact that it's Ron who uses the spell unprompted and gets it right first time is really nice. And what I do like about it is that it is still down to Hermione that they are able to overcome the troll because Ron wasn't able to do it in the class and it was because Hermione was being a little bossy know-it-all as they refer to her uh it's because she was like that that he was able to do it you know unprompted first time I thought that was actually really nice and so I thought that was actually a really nice difference in the book so even even if they had done that in the movie it still is all three of them overcoming the troll but, but not as obvious. It's not like, which I can understand, because uh, obviously uh, a lot of young people would have gone to see Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone in the cinema and so on. And so I don't mind the fact that Hermione uh, audibly directs Ron, because Ron still has to get it right. And also, you know, he's there trying to help her and everything, so it is the three of them defeating the troll. But there's something really nice about the fact that it's a lot more subtle, the fact that Ron is able to do do the spell. It's the first spell that pops into his mind, and he does it right because Hermione had berated him earlier on. So it is still all three of them. I thought that was really nice. I, I really did. Um, we get more troll bogeys. Let's not talk about that. Uh, the teachers come charging in. Snape... Snape's leg completely fine in this. There's no mention of like Harry spotting uh, Snape's leg damage, which would have been the only moment in the movie where Harry would have thought, hey, something's going on. Because like I say, in the movie, we get Snape backing out of the Great Hall, but it's not like Ron and Harry had noticed that. It's just there for the audience. And so that's another difference. Obviously, we will come on to that in the next chapters. So yeah, I, I make a note about how uh, how the line is different about she may not need a saving if we hadn't locked her in there. Uh, uh, and it being different from, um, from it would have been different. It, it, it was different from Harry telling Ron she, she wouldn't need a saving if you hadn't insulted, insulted her. I do get the feeling that Harry feels bad because because he's he, he's delighted that Hermione's not talking to, to to him this entire time and so I feel like in the books Harry does feel maybe not as bad as Ron but both of them do feel bad about what they you know what, what they made Hermione do but like to be so upset and everything so but I, what I like about it is that it's not explicitly explained. Like I say, in the extended version of the movies, which is the one which I reacted to, we do also have the line where Ron says, what are friends for? Which is a very nice scene, and like Hermione smiles, and it's like, okay, they're all friends now. Whereas in a book, they become friends by basically, Hermione's gone back to to, to uh, Gryffindor Tower, and Ron and, uh, and Harry get there, and they just stand there awkwardly and then all just say thanks to each other and then disperse. I love that because that is such a childish thing to do. But it's sort of like they re they clearly want to be friends. They all want to be friends at this point. But they can't like, they can't like, you know, big up each other. And they're just like, thanks. And it's all awkward. And they just disperse. I thought I mean, that's such more of a realistic thing. I do love the line of like, what are friends for in the extended version? But would a kid really say that? That seemed like a bit of a Hollywood line. The fact that they're all together and they just say thanks and just like disperse and now just by default they're friends I really loved. In fact the last line of, of this chapter is just lovely. If, uh, I think I've actually written it down. Yes, uh, there are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other and knocking out a 12 foot mountain troll is one of them. That's such a sweet line. That is such a sweet line to wrap this, this chapter up. This was brilliant. Like I say, Hermione's role in the scene in the bathroom is very different. But she is important, guys. It's not a damsel in distress, distress situation. If she hadn't had to go at Ron for getting, getting that spell um, incorrect in the class and shown how to do it, Ron wouldn't have been able to do it. And he just does it instinctively. He, 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 he sa it, it says he does the first spell that he can think of. And it turned out to be the spell that Hermione had shown him how to do earlier on. So I loved it. I really loved it. And that last line of that chapter is just gorgeous. It really is. 
Oh man, I, I completely forgot one of my favourite bits. I mean, well, there's, there's a couple of bits. So when um, McGonagall is like, you know, having to go at Ron and Harry and I like, say, what are you doing down here and everything, it does say how uh, Harry is, uh, starts to think that the 50 points he was going to win for Gryffindor weren't, weren't going to happen. So I love the fact that Harry actually thought that he was actually going to be, you know, cashing in for Gryffindor, but no, it turned out that it's going completely the other way. And then it's absolutely, when Hermione like takes the blame, for like uh for uh for the troll situation and everything uh it like says how um inside harry's head obviously which is how most of this is is told which i'm not sure it's the case completely for the next chapter but um yeah it, it, from from harry's perspective it's like it like says hermione lying is like snape handing out sweets just like an amazing image, guys. I'd love to see that. I certainly would uh, accept. I would. Okay, I'd accept a, a sweet from uh, from Snape, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't consume it, though. I really wouldn't. I should say that sweet uh, uh, in the UK amounts to. If you're from America, I think you refer to it as candy. That's what we call sweets. Uh, we we call candy sweets over here, and so. I loved that line, and I could I could leave that out of my notes, guys, because I I had to mention that. I loved it. So now the summary for uh, chapter 11, Quidditch. Uh, winter has come to Hogwarts and Harry prepares for his first Quidditch match. Um, Hermione, who is now helping them study and is checking their homework, has let Harry uh, the Quidditch for the Ages book. They're confronted by Snape, who uh, confiscates the book and docks him five points. Harry notices he is limping as he walks away. It's slightly different from in the, in the movie. Later, Harry decides to ask Snape for the book back, but when he goes to the staff room, he sees Filch trying to bandage Snape's heavily scarred leg. After saying, how are you meant to keep an eye on all three heads at once, Snape spots Harry and ang angrily orders him to get out. Harry reports uh, this back to Ron and Hermione. Uh, the Quidditch match between Gryffindor and Slytherin happens. As much detail as I'll go in before my notes, guys. But yes, a lot happens in, in this bit. But uh, skipping forward a little bit, shortly after being fouled by Marcus Flint, Harry's broom starts to try to buck and throw him, uh, throw him off. Hermione grabs Hagrid's binoculars and spies Snape, appearing to jinx the Nimbus 2000. She rushes her way across the stands, not even apologising uh, for knocking Krill headfirst into the row in front of him. Uh, she creates a, a blue flame and sets Snape's robes on fire. Harry is able to right himself and before speedingly uh, going, uh, swooping down towards the snitch. He tumbles to the floor, covering his mouth with his hands, uh, uh, before spitting it, uh, spitting the snitch out, giving, giving Gryffindor the win. After being filled in by Hermione with what happened, Harry tells Hagrid of what he saw uh, with Snape's leg and him heading towards the third floor the night the troll was there. Hagrid tells the three that Snape would never try to steal something or kill a student and that they should forget about Fluffy and the item that belongs to Dumbledore and Nicholas Fumel. Hagrid being a brilliant secret keeper right there. I love that. Yeah, I, I love that part of Hagrid, guys. I kind of wish that that was more in the later movies. I know that there's one bit where Dobby, like, in, in uh, Chamber of Secrets, that says, I shouldn't have said that. But I love the fact that Hagrid always is just spilling the beans or spilling the tea, apparently. Uh, some people say, but yes, I certainly know spilling the beans as being the term. Hagrid's great. He really is. I'm hoping he's in these books more than he is in than he is in in the later movies because quite frankly in uh, part two of Deathly Hallows for a lot of it I was like saying well, where's Hagrid have I missed something but then he's like right at the end but you know I guess it makes it may maybe he was caught before the invasion well maybe actually that's a good point he could have been because the barrier uh, the barrier that they put around Hogwarts doesn't include um, the Quidditch field maybe it didn't include Fleming Hagrid's house thanks a lot I need that scene of a thing Thanks a lot, guys. What, what about me? Anyway, that's not covered in... Uh, well, it might be covered in the books, but it's not covered in Philosopher's Stone, so let's go over to my notes. So, yeah, first thing that, that, that jumps out at me, guys, is that the fact it is properly wintry at this point. It's actually really, really cold. It's November, and um, and it's uh, Harry's first game. Now, this was certainly not the case in the movie. It's like a glorious summer day in the first, uh, in the first movie, but the fact that it is winter conditions would certainly make... This being uh, Harry's first Quidditch match, a lot more dangerous. It does speculate that it's not the first match of the season. 
And I thought that Snape said something like, Congrat- uh, good luck in today's season opener, Harry, even if it is against Slivering. He actually doesn't say that, guys, but I thought that's what he said. But I do feel like in the movie it is suggested that it's the opening game. I could be wrong. But no, the series, the season has been going on, but it's just this is how he's first game that he's got, going to be playing in after doing so much training behind doors so no one else can see what their tactics are and the fact that that Harry has this uh, the skills to pay the bills as it were we find out that Hermione is helping uh, Ron and Harry out with with their homework she's not cheating per se because she's just she's marking it afterwards and so then she'll hand it back and they'll think, oh, we got that wrong. So it's actually a good sense of, it's actually a good way of learning, guys, before handing the paper into the, the teacher. I guess it is a little bit dishonest, but it's certainly not che cheating. But one thing that we really get pushed in this chapter, including the part later on where she sets fire to the robes, is how Hermione's really, really changed since the troll incident. Now, in the, in the movies, well, let's say in the Philosopher's Stone, I don't think Hermione comes off as someone who is like a real rules follower, like Percy is in the books and everything. I don't think she comes off like that. I just feel like she comes off as a very gifted witch and a very intelligent witch who's done a lot of homework and everything. But this definitely does seem to be pushing the narrative of her not being a rule breaker. The fact that she was having to go at Ron and Harry for sneaking out at night in the previous chapter. The fact that, you know, she, she actually, I didn't mention it, but in the previous chapter, she's like furious that Harry has got a wand. Uh, a, I always say wand instead of broom. Got a broom uh, for for basically, you know, sneaking out at night. Well, for, 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 for breaking the rules, I'm, I, I'm sorry. Uh, obviously, you know, flying off uh, after a hoot had told them not to. And so the rule following Hermione is a lot more pushed in the books. And I think it actually adds a lot to her character. It certainly makes this chapter a lot more interesting. The fact that not only is she helping Ron and um, Harry out with their homework, but she also makes like a little fire in a jam jar, like a blue fire in a, in, in a jam jar to keep them warm as they're like in the corridors. And we have previously heard guys that Filch has said no magic in the corridors. And so... Lot, I gotta say, guys, Hermione is so different in this book. She really is, and I gotta say, I'm loving it. I think though she might actually. Oh, is she my favorite character? At the end of each book, I will definitely do my favorite character from the books, guys, as I did with the movies. But Hermione's so different. So yes, before he gets confiscated, Harry has the um, Quidditch for the ages, and he finds out that there's 700 different kind of fouls in the sport, and apparently they, uh, which is ridiculous, and apparently they all got broke in one World Cup game in 1473. Love to see that game, guys. This game, I've got to say, guys, Quidditch, uh, you can't, I can't count the one which is in um, Half-Blood Prince, but it does seem that outside influence does seem to be a very big thing in this sport. Obviously, it is in the first game with... Uh, who we think is Snape uh, jinxing uh, Harry's broom. Um, I guess outside influence isn't really affected in the game where Griff uh, that Hufflepuff destroy Gryffindor. But the, yeah, the, the, the Dementors are there though. So there's no, no, not cheating per se. I don't understand the wolf thing, by the way. The fact that Harry sees a wolf up in the air. Is, that, is his mind just going crazy? Or is it something that Sirius is doing? I guess we'll find out in a couple of books' time, guys. Let's, get, let's try to stay on track. Um, yeah, it says that, that referees uh, are like uh, have been known to disappear for months during games and turn up in the Sahara Desert. So it does sound like the game is actually more dangerous for referees. But yeah, I've, I've got my notes at the fact that cheating does seem to be a big thing in this sport. And it does remind me of Blood Bowl, which is a tabletop game. It's like Games Workshop, Warhammer, you may know, uh, sort of game. Um, but I know it mostly for the PC ports of it, which I've actually played a lot. And like cheating is like really, really heavily involved in it. You can like bribe referees, you can make like, you know, asteroids come flying down onto the pitch and everything. It does feel like cheating is absolutely a part, goes part and parcel with this game, but there's still 700 fouls. In fact, later on, um, Marcus Flint gets reprimanded for blocking Harry, which seems like a small crime in this sport, but because we get, um, 
That's true, actually. We get one student being led by two um, slivering students into one of the stands, and that would sure, surely be seen as being uh, blocking, unless blocking is only a, uh, only you know a, a fallible case when it's the seeker that's the victim, which could be the case, guys. You get that in American football, where certain rules only stand for certain types of players, and so very interesting. Um, Yes, Snape is now limping, which we did get in the movie uh, in the Great Hall, where uh, he's like saying, even if it's slivering that you're playing today, and then he walks off and they're like, hey, he's limping. But we get a whole addition here, guys. We get Snape um, in, in the staff room with Filch bandaging his leg up, which seems odd. One, sure, it should be Madame Pomfrey, but maybe he wants it on the lowdown. He, he doesn't, doesn't want... Um, he doesn't want the... He doesn't want anyone above Filch knowing what he's up to. Maybe, maybe that's it. You'd, you, but you'd want Pomfrey to be doing it, um, personally, over Filch, I guess. And imagine she probably has cleaner fingernails, at least. Uh, but yes, we hear about the staff room. I'd love to know more about that, guys, because we certainly didn't get a staff room in, in the movies at all, I don't think. No, we, we certainly didn't. I'm pretty sure we didn't. And yeah, it's, there's there's like a line where like Snape straight up like says how he meant to get past you know how he meant to keep an eye on all three of its heads, which is that, that's that seems a bit on the nose. The fact that Harry hears this line, but yeah, that is directly linking the injury, the limp, him walking off um, during the troll attack with uh, well the three-headed dog or Fluffy as we establish in this chapter. Did feel a little bit on the nose, but I really like the idea of Harry sneaking off to the staff room to try and ask for the book back, and then he actually tries to get in there and just take it back, which is again, again, character building for Harry, guys. He does seem very different in the book as well. They all do, actually. Obviously, Ron and his family, uh, well, Ron's situation with, with his family is already being uh, put in there, uh, where he does feel, you know, he feels almost like a letdown to his family all the time. Hermione not being a rule breaker to being the biggest rule breaker of all time. And Harry having it in for Draco to that level in his mind. And the fact that he's thinking about popping in and just taking the book out again. Lots of character building, guys. I, I, I You love to see it. So we have the scene where Hermione and Ron are trying to get uh, Harry to eat breakfast. And Seamus says, I'm pretty sure this line is in the, is in the movie. But Seamus like, says uh, that the Seekers are always the ones who get uh, nobbled. Which is a funny word. But yes, um, I like that. I'm pretty certain that wasn't in the movie. It could have been, though, guys. Um, uh, I think it's... Uh, I think it's Dean Thomas, Seamus, Neville, maybe, and Ron and Hermione who make like a massive sign with flashing paint on it saying Potter for President, which is brilliant. That should have been the movie. I would have loved that. I guess in a way they didn't want... Because we do hear at the start of this chapter how Harry is like half hearing people saying, oh, I can't wait to see how good Harry is at, at, at this, and half people saying, hey, I'll be holding a... a, 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 a I can't remember what they say, but like, you know, Holding something underneath you, like, when you fall off and stuff. So, but uh, people are actually really excited about Harry. And I think that, that would have actually give, put Harry over as being this this legend without earning it that earlier on. But yeah, I I, I, I kind of just want to see that sign. In fact, I want to see some fan art of that. That would be actually really funny. Potter for president. What an amazing uh, thing. So we have a scene in the locker room where uh, Wood is about to give like this big speech and the Weasley twins just basically say it before him and like say we've heard it loads of times before. Uh, we hear about Angelina Johnson, uh, who is a chaser. I'm sorry if I'm getting these roles wrong, guys, but Angelina jo Johnson uh, being on the team. And so I, 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 I actually looked her up, guys, and she is what the, the girl who one of the uh, twins takes to your ball. But yeah, very nice to see her mentioned this early, including blooming Katie Bell being on the team, guys. I was like, hang on, I know that name. That's the girl who scared the bejesus out of me in our footprint. Scariest bit of any of these movies, guys. I think it actually was, even over the spider scene. Her face going, ah! I still have it embedded in my retina. Um, but yes, and we get the, the game going on. Now, it is my opinion that this is actually really well written, guys. It's, it's all been said. 99% of the game is being literally commentated by Lee Jordan. Well, I hope we do see more of after 
um, after this book, guys, because he becomes basically non-existent after that in, in, in the movies. He might be there, but I don't think he gets a, any moment to shine, but he is hilarious in the books. Seriously? I don't remember him being this biased to Gryffindor in, um, in in the movies, guys, but he is absolutely hilarious. And McGonagall's basically sat next to him, like, telling him off whenever he, like, goes too far or says something inappropriate. It's freaking hilarious, guys. It's actually, in my opinion, a great way of explain the action having just the commentator do it i mean that's what commentators are for and so for me i think this section is actually really well done i gotta say jim dales is slightly easier to follow because he's saying it a little bit slower but stephen fry's commentary of it is freaking hilarious <laughs> he's, he's doing it really really fast and when, you know, like whenever mcgonagall pops he's like jordan it's, it's like really funny how like he keeps on switching between the two characters uh during that bit so both audiobooks absolutely have their plus sides guys but jim dales is easier to follow during it but stephen fry's is definitely funnier in, in this moment i i freaking it was a very funny uh listen so yeah, the snitch doesn't appear straight away, which I guess is the case in in the movie, isn't it? As I remember in the movie, it like pops up in front of Harry's face, which is very kind. But from what I gather, at the start of the game, the snitch is active and going, but you just had to find it. And so um, no one sees it for a while until Lee Jordan actually mentions where it is, which is kind of strange. So but that is, I don't think either Seeker had actually seen it before Lee Jordan saw it. Um, so that's kind of... I'd say helping his team out, but it's also hindering his team, because obviously Slivering are going to know as well. Jordan actually becoming a big part of, of the game there. Uh, yeah, so Flint fouls Harry by blocking, which is very interesting. I don't know if that is something which you're just not allowed to block a Seeker. Um, or maybe you're allowed to block Chasers as well. I, d I don't know. But uh, and gets a free shot, essentially a penalty. And there's this hilarious bit where after that happens, like everyone's booing and saying it's a disgrace and everything. And uh, Dean Thomas in the crowd is like, "Send him off, ref, red card." And Rod's like, "What the hell's a red card?" <laughs> Love that. And like, and Hagrid like says, "Yeah, yeah, we should change the rules and get bring in red cards because that's uh, something we can get rid of." Uh, but yeah, apparently people cannot get sent off in in. Um, in Quidditch. I'm sure there are exceptions. I think that if you if you straight up try to kill another student, the game would be abandoned. You would just be sent off. But yes, um, yeah, I think that Ron does actually straight up say say that, that that we don't have sending off in Quidditch. Very interesting. Lots of very interesting details like that coming in in this chapter, guys. Uh, by this point, Jordan's uh, Lee Jordan's just gone completely rogue. <laughs> he's gone completely rogue. He's like saying, oh yeah, Flint could have killed uh, killed him there, but I guess that's just what happens. And my goggles like saying, Jordan! <laughs> Fry's, Fry's telling of this is actually freaking hilarious, guys. Um, uh, and <laughs> what is he says? Uh, oh yeah, like, uh, I think it's Flint who gets hit by a bludger. And, um, and Jordan like says, oh, he's been hit hard by a bludger there. Hope it, hit, hope it broke his nose. <laughs> I need more Lee Jordan in my life, guys. So I really do. I thought he was great in, in this. I do hope he does feature more. I mean, we've already heard about Lavender. We've already heard about a Angelina Johnson. We've already heard about Katie Bell. So I think we will hear more about uh, Jordan in the future. So one thing I think that they could have included in, um, in the movie... Is the fact that, that Flint like, does block Harry. And then shortly after... The broom starts going crazy and everything. And there's a bit where Shameless like says, Oh, is is the broom damaged because of that hit? And Hagrid like says, um, no, a broom wouldn't do that. The only way that that'd happen is is uh, dark magic being used. And that's what gives Hermione the oh hang on. What Snape up to at this point? I also like it because as I remember when I reacted to the Philosopher's Stone, I as I remember I, I first said, oh, had they given him a, 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 a bad broom? Because I didn't really realise that it was McGonagall that had given him the broom. That's a lot clearer in the books. But then I do say, oh, is someone trying to... Uh, is someone putting a spell on him? Uh, and then it cuts to Snape. And as I remember, I did get a comment saying, how did he know that was going to happen? I was just speculating on what was happening in front of me. If Flint had just hit uh, Harry's broom... If that had just happened, my mind would have thought, oh god, he's, his broom is broken. 
I do feel like that would have been a subtly, a more subtle way of doing it in, in, in the movie. So yes, once uh, Hagrid has said this about it would only be a uh, powerful dark magic that would do that, Hermione then grabs his binoculars and spies Snape um, d doing the the jinx as as it refers to, and rushes off to go and uh, to go and stop him. Again, this is the the rule breaking Hermione, and in the in the book. It's a more of a payoff because she, she before up to this point, she has been known as this goody two shoes know it all. Uh, much more than in the movies. Like I say, in the movies, she's just like a very intelligent, very skilled student. But the fact that she's not a rule breaker is made a lot clearer, it, it, much clearer in the books. And it makes the moments like this really pay off. The fact that it's like, wait a minute, who's this Hermione? It's like a uh, perfect example. In Order of the Phoenix, when uh, when she's like saying uh, it's quite exciting to break the rules, Ron literally said, "Who are you? And what have you done, with Hermione?" That's the Hermione that we're getting here. The fact that she is this that up to this point she's been this rule follower, and now suddenly she's a freaking anarchist. <laughs> and so that makes that moment even better. She like knocks past Krill. It, it doesn't make it doesn't make a big thing about it at all. It just says she knocks past Krill, knocking him into the front row. Obviously, that's when the jinx is actually broken, but it's a lot more subtly. Uh, I, when you watch the movie back, you straight up see Quirrell like going at Harry when Snape is like, blah, 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 like, like that. He's like straight up just staring at Harry. Um, doing the jinx, but it, but there's no tell of that at all in the book. So that was really subtly done. I I, I do appreciate that. It looked, like it says she even didn't apologize when knocking past Quirrell. Just leaves it at that, and then goes sets fire to Snape's uh, cloak with blue flame again. She's obsessed with blue in this. In, in this. Uh, apparently, Neville is sobbing into Hagrid's jacket during this. I gotta say, guys, they are layer. They are laying it on thick. We're making Neville seem like a a buffoon in the book, much more than in the movie. Sure, like someone like does a curse against him, and obviously like saying, "Oh, fight you!" at the end and everything, and he loses his toad and everything. But in the book, he it really is laying it on thick. The fact that he's meant to be this buffoon of a character, the fact that he's crying into Hagrid's jacket is it is adorable. But yeah, uh, so after that, uh, the game seems to end very abruptly, and the way it's at least written in the book, it almost does sound like Harry was just lucky, because in the movie he's like he's like. Fleming surfing on his broom. So that requires a hell of a lot of speed and skill and everything. Whereas in the book, it does kind of sound like it was a much more lucky affair. It just like he swooped down, went to the ground, spat out the the the, the, um, the snitch. In fact, uh, Flint even argues that he, that, that shouldn't have been the end of the game because he didn't catch it. He accidentally swallowed it. He didn't swallow it, but he put it in his mouth, I guess. Also, after spitting out, Harry does say, I've got the golden snitch. <laughs> I'm glad that wasn't in it, guys, because that's way too cheesy. <laughs> that's way too cheesy. That wasn't in the movie, I should say. Yeah, so Hagrid uh, uh, talking about Fluffy is like the immediate... It like happens like 20 minutes after uh, the end of the game, where I'm pretty sure it's meant to be a different day. Um, where like he says about Fluffy and Nicholas Vermeil and everything in the movie. But no, it's, it's straight away after us. And, and when he says about Nicholas Vermeil, Harry has this line, Aha! So there's someone called Nicholas Vermeil involved, is there? I've noticed particularly in this chapter and the next, Harry really is... I don't want to say mocking. But he's like almost making fun of the fact that Hagrid is slipping up and saying all this stuff. And like, you know, trying to get him to say more and everything. Whereas in the movie, he didn't really have that. Harry is very well done in these books. And he does have a lot more character. Hermione having a lot more character. Ron, everyone has more character, guys. Lee Jordan has more character. Like I say, I need more Lee Jordan in my life. He was absolutely hilarious. But let's move on to chapter 12. Which is called... Oh yes! The, the Mirror of... Erizdi. I don't know how to pronounce it. Erizet. Okay, so this is another chunky um, summary, guys, but I'll get through it now. Hogwarts has been hit by heavy snow as Christmas approaches. Most of the students will be going home for the holidays, but Harry signs up to stay at Hogwarts as well as the Weasley brothers as their parents are travelling to Romania. Hermione will be travelling home for Christmas. Uh, Ron... Uh, Harry and Hermione have been searching the library for information about Nicholas Vermeil, with Madame Pince stopping them from entering the restricted section. Lovely to hear from Madame Pince. 
Um, Harry awakens on Christmas Day in surprise to see, surprised to see a pile of presents at the end of his bed. The last one doesn't seem to say who it's from. Ron is shocked to see that it is an invisibility cloak, which are apparently very rare and very expensive. The notes it came with said that it's belonged to Harry's father. Ron and Harry spend Christmas with the rest of the Weasley brothers, which is a lovely sequence, but we'll go into it once we go through the uh, footnotes. That night, as everyone else sleeps, Harry realises he can now go anywhere around Hogwarts with his new invisibility cloak. Exiting the dorm, he, hear, he heads to the restricted section of the library. After lo o looking over several books, he finally opens one. A loud screech comes bellowing out of the book, attracting Filch's attention. Uh, Harry flees and gets lost somewhere around the school. He he backs into a random door to hide from Filch and Snape, who had apparently asked Filch to notify him if he, anyone is seen walking around at night. In the room, he sees a large mirror. When looking into it, he nearly screams in terror. The mirror seems to show at least 10 other people in the mirror with him. Harry realises that a woman right behind him with his eyes and a man standing beside her with, with, um, with a similar haircut are his parents. He recognises that everyone in the mirror is being a part of his family. After spending a long time staring into it, he hears someone uh, outside and flees back to the dorm. He fills Ron in the next morning and convinces him to come with him that night. Upon looking into the mirror, Ron only saw himself, but as head boy and, and, and cup champion. The following night, Harry goes back alone, but he is startled to hear a voice behind him. Dumbledore explains what the mir mirror is and why him and Ron saw what they saw. He tells Harry the mirror will be moved the following day to another part of the school. Really like this chapter, guys, mainly because of the Christmas stuff, because it genuinely made me hungry. It's like the, the, the food description in this sounded amazing. But let's go through my through my notes as as um, as usual. So that I was actually getting ill by it being so cold outside, um, which is understandable. You know, if they have to fly around the countryside like this in, in this sort of where it's uh, it's understandable. But it is really actually properly cold. Like, and Snape uh, Snape's classroom is apparently in the dungeon, which I which I didn't realize uh, upon in the movies, and it's like absolutely terrible really cold down there it's like really uncomfortably uh, uncomfortably cold little side note actually guys i did actually realize that the room uh, in the movie where snape's um snape's uh, room is for potions um is actually filmed pretty close to me pretty close not as much, it's it's like around an hour's drive and so at some point I, I think i might actually visit this place it looks gorgeous actually it's actually very close to some other areas as well in future movies so yes uh, i'll check that out when i do a blog for that uh, Harry signs up to stay at Hogwarts, which is very interesting. I thought that maybe... I don't know how they would have been able to contact Hogwarts, actually. They probably wouldn't have been able to. But I guess in my head, I thought that Vernon and Petunia had said that he wouldn't be coming home. But no, Harry actually signs up to stay at uh, Hogwarts, which is obviously the right decision. Because I, I can't imagine his Christmas would have been overly joyous with, with the Dursleys. Uh, Draco mocking. Uh, oh yes, yeah, so, so Draco since the Quidditch match has been like really envious of of Harry, and so is like trying to like make fun of him and everything. But apparently, like no one's really paying attention to it because everyone's so in awe of uh, of how amazing he did. And so he has doubled down now in just being really unpleasant about Harry and his parents and and Ron's family not having much money and everything. He's really like lay, laying it on thick now. Uh, Snape once again takes po takes points off uh, Ron when like Ron like reacts to something that Draco says. It's interesting, guys, because Snape is like, I swear it wasn't this much in the movie, but it's like every single scene that he's in, he's taking points off Harry and Ron, and so he is clearly playing this uh, playing the points game here. But yeah, whenever he shows up, someone's losing points. Um, so yeah, it also mentions that Harry and Ron, like, that evening, once, like, you know, all the other students had, had gone home and everything, uh, like, sat in the, um, Gryffindor, um, social room, and just, like, were talking about, like, ways of getting Draco expelled, which again goes back to this whole thing of, they really, really hate Draco, and again, 
Draco hurts them. But this hatred for Draco just wasn't in the movie at all, guys. And it really built... It, for one, it makes Harry and Ron seem like much more realistic characters. But, but two, it adds to their character as well. You don't want your, your, your protagonist to just be a perfect perfect person who like you know who's like morally perfect and never thinks badly about anyone no harry and ron absolutely despise this guy and they they are joking but they are actually talking about ways of getting him actually uh, kicked out of hogwarts it's a lovely scene with the professors dressing the trees in the in the great hall which is lovely uh oh yes harry bringing up nicholas Fermel with hagrid um again he really does seem to be and ron in fact they really do seem to be m Goading, I guess is the best term. Uh, goading uh, Hagrid at this point. Like, like Hag Hag Hagrid would like to say, why are you going to the library just before Christmas? As well, we're trying to find out more about Nicholas Vermel. And Ron's like, unless you want to tell us more about him. So they really are, like, they are, like, grinding the gears into Hagrid here. Who's getting really frustrated with the fact that he's let, uh, let this secret slip. But, um, yeah, they do seem like almost like they are, like, mocking slash goading them a bit. So obviously they, they're going off to the library to find out about Nicholas Flamel. One thing which I didn't actually realise, guys, is that the library scenes in the movie is actually... Um, is it the Bodleian Library? It's a, it's a very famous library in Oxford, guys. Which obviously, I, I come from Oxfordshire. But yes, that scene was absolutely one of the ones filmed very near me. Um, and yeah... They're trying to get into the restricted section, but Madame Pince is like keeping an eye on them, making sure they don't. Like I say, I where do you... I think Madame Pince in Chambers, in the standard edition, is in one scene for like one second. But in the extended edition, you do see her briefly a, a little bit longer. And I think she just looks so awesome. I was hoping for her to come back at some point. But I'm delighted to hear that she's already been mentioned in the Philosopher's Stone, guys. Obviously, with a lot of these teachers, they will be one and done with the movies. But it's really cool to hear her name crop up so early on. The fact that you can just walk into the restricted section does seem quite odd to me. It's it's only restricted for ages though, and so older students are allowed to pop in there. But if there's dangerous stuff in there, but I get I guess that's the point of having Madame Pince there to make sure that no one has it. But yeah, like security could be a little bit stronger in this place. They need ghost security. That would have been ideal. I guess that's kind of the case with the paintings, isn't it? Uh, oh yes, Ron suggests to Hermione that he should that that she should ask her, her parents about Nicholas Vermel because uh, it will be safe to do that. And she says, "Well, yeah, it'll be very safe because they're dentists." Which is interesting that that's been mentioned so early on because that only gets mentioned in Half Blood Prince that, that her parents are dentists. But um, I believe that Nicholas Vermel was actually a real person though, so there is a small chance that they would have actually known who it was. But uh, yeah, no, I believe Nicholas Vermel is, is a is a real person from history. Alchemist? I could be wrong. I'm not unconventional. Um, Wizard Chess, which is obviously uh, in the movie, guys. You see like them playing at, 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 in the Great Hall, and obviously it pays off later on. But apparently in this, the chess pieces actually talk to the player, which would just be the most annoying thing in, in the world. Like I say, well, send him over there, because he, he's less valuable than me, and stuff like that, which is amazing. I'm pretty certain that wasn't in the movie. That really should be, though, because that's such a charming little idea but it's actually called wizard chess i guess because you had to ignore the freaking chess pieces so you can get on with what you're doing so yes we have uh harry's gifts that he gets from everyone he gets a lovely fl uh a, a a um oh what's the uh, a flute made by hagrid which is very very nice um he actually gets 50 pence from vernon and petuna which i certainly didn't see coming Good for him. Ron is amazed by it because he's not he's never seen like muggle money and everything. And to be fair, the 50 pence is a strangely shaped coin, guys. It's like, you know, it's uh, it's not just circular, and so he's actually in awe by it. And I think he actually uh, I think Harry actually lets him have it, in fact. Uh Harry gets a Weasley sweater, as well as George and Fred and Percy as well, who all show up like large in this chapter, which is wonderful to see. Um that's that's like they're like Fred and George are like really mocking like um, Ron to put the sweater on as well as Percy as well who doesn't want to wear his but they, they force him to they force him to wear it. It actually says that they nearly knock uh, Percy's glasses off which is obviously different from in the move uh, in the movies. Uh, Hermione gives uh, Harry uh, some ch chocolate frogs and gives Ron some every favorite beans which is very very nice good on her. I'm guessing that must have been from Hogsmeade, unless they know, unless, 
maybe there's a tuck shop in... I don't know if you know what a tuck shop is, but maybe there's a tuck shop in Hogwarts where you can buy sweets and everything. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Or maybe she hasn't delivered. You never know. Amazon. Well, Ow Owlazen. Oh, there's a great bit where... Uh, I think it says that Ron's jumper doesn't have a, uh, an R on it, maybe? I think. And, like, uh, Fred and George says, um, we're not stupid. We, we know our name are Gred and Forge. Amazing. The twins are so well done in the book, guys. And they were brilliant in the movies as well, guys. But at least in the books, we get we get a lot more time for them. And, like, everything they do is freaking hilarious. It really is. Uh, so we hear about wizard crackers. Now, I don't know if you guys from outside the UK will know what crackers are. I'm pretty sure that they are a UK exclusive when it comes to Christmas. Uh, so, they're, like, I mean, it does explain what they are. But they're, like, pieces of paper wrapped into, like, a tube. Uh, with like a it, it, with like a bang thing when you pull them apart and then you get like, like some cheap stuff inside them. It's like a big thing which you do at, uh, during Christmas dinner. You, you like do the crackers first and you like wear these little crowns and everything. But no, we have wizard crackers here, guys, which are like you know the most expensive ones you can get. Like uh, they like have blue smoke coming out. Like they have like full admiral hats coming out and like live mice apparently. Uh, yeah, they sound absolutely amazing. Hagrid kisses McGonagall whilst drunk, which is amazing. I want to see that in the movie. Apparently, she laughs it off as well. I think, I think that she's also very tipsy as well. Uh, the food, like I said, it's it just sounds brilliant, guys. And I'm vegan, guys, so I can't have half, you know, half most of the stuff mentioned in this chapter. But this whole scene where it's describing the food and the fireplace and like the crackers and the games and everything, uh, imagine it. Imagining it for Harry, it must have just been probably like the greatest day of his life. Maybe outside Diagon Alley. Uh, no, I, I'd say no. This is I, I think this is even more. There's no Draco for one thing, like you know, trying to ruin his blooming day as as always. But you just imagine that it's got to be like just the best, obviously the best Christmas ever, but possibly the best day for Harry ever. It's, it's really quite sweet. Yes, so he gets like some like he gets some more gifts like non-exploding balloons and like grow your own wart kit, which sounds like the sort of thing that George and, and Fred would sell later on. Um, yes, he gets his own wizard chess set. I think you get teams. I think it's a it does say set, but um, it I think earlier on it said that that he's been playing wizard chess with Ron using Seamus's set. So does that mean that you own a team and then you put the two sets together to play against maybe? That's what I, I assumed it was, maybe. Apparently Ron is still destroying him at it though, which again, it, it's in the movie. The fact that Ron is like this very good uh, chess player. And yeah, then they all just settle down and like, after having like a snowball fight and everything, they, get, they, they, they go back to the dorms and settle down. And like th at that point, Harry realizes, "Hang on, I can go anywhere." Now he he, he does say that he, it does say that he, he was going to wake Ron, but because it's the first time using his father's cloak, he wanted to do it alone. And there is that great line which said, uh, "Ron grunted in his sleep," which again I wouldn't have noticed if it hadn't been for the comments, which we will get to in a moment, guys. Once I get through this uh, these chapter notes. So the whole scene in the library seems very very accurate. I got to say that when it does say that when. Uh, Harry opens the book, a scream comes out of the book. It doesn't say a face like I was like in the movie. Uh, maybe they just did that because they had the CG and everything and they thought it'd look nice and it'd be more shocking for the audience and everything. But no, it, in the book, it just says a, a scream comes out of it. It doesn't say a face or anything. So that is one different bit. And at this point, we have Filch, like, you know, like it being notified and everything and going to get Sni uh, Snape, or should I say Snipe? Because I'm pretty sure that Jim Dale refers to Snape as Snipe. Just once, just once in, the, in this moment. Just, I thought I'd mention it just because, you know, because I noticed it. Uh, but yes, there's no Quirrell scene. There's no scene where, where like, um, where where Snape, like, has Quirrell, like, you know, up against the wall. Not like that. Like, you know, in his face and everything. Um, maybe that comes later. I find that a lot of these things, like like the legendary in the earlier chapters, it, I was like, oh, there's no le legendary. Well, we hear about it in the next chapter, so maybe that will be coming up later on. But Quirrell is definitely less of a presence in the in this book. Oh, actually, maybe he isn't. Maybe Snape is so much more of a presence that it makes Quirrell seem less of a presence. But yeah, it really is pointing towards Snape um, 
more than the movie is at this point. And yes, um, Harry then finds the mirror in, in the secret room. Uh, he's actually scared though. He actually says that he very nearly screams out, which is obviously very different. He's he's very, very mellow in the movie as soon as he sees them. And like I said, it's it, there's like at least 10 people behind him, like old people with an old guy with similar knees to him and stuff like this. And so he realizes that it's actually his extended family, which I actually really like. I guess in the movie, it's going to be more of an emotional thing if it is just the two parents. I get that. But in the in, in the mirror is showing Harry the fact that... I guess in a way, it's showing that Harry is in a way jealous of Ron. Because Ron has this like very famous extended family and everything. Not so much extended, but he has a big family. And so maybe that's Harry subconsciously thinking, I wish I had a big family. I had a mum and dad and they would have had relatives and so on. And so that's like... That's a reaction to how Ron has this bigger family. But obviously, especially in this chapter, when Ron looks into the mirror, we realise that, you know, in a sense, Ron wants the opposite. He doesn't want anyone else to be in the limelight. He just wants to be him there as a success that he can be proud of. Which I get, I find very, very interesting, guys. I, I really do. It That aspect of Ron is so much clearer made in in the books than than in than in the movies and this scene right there uh the fact that he's completely alone in the mirror and yet harry had so many people that parallel is actually quite striking the parallel between harry seeing his parents and ron seeing himself as a success isn't that much of a parallel but if you're gonna have loads of people being one and just one person the other one that's very interesting i don't think that makes ron selfish at all he's not, he he's he's down on himself I guess is the best way of putting it. And so he wants to see himself as being a success. The success that he isn't, you know? So I I find Ron very, very interesting. It's interesting, I feel like this would have been a nice touch. They actually aggressively argue over the mirror. It's like saying, hey, you, you, you've had enough time in front of it. Obviously in the movie, the, the, like, the mirror is so big that they could easily just stand looking in the mirror next to each other. But they're actually almost fighting over it at, at, um, at this point where... Uh, Again, they hear something outside and they have to, uh, have to uh, flee off. But yes, that was a very interesting take on that scene. That bit was very different. And uh, the aggression, I thought, was actually quite interesting. The fact they are fighting over the mirror. Which obviously explains why, you know, Dumbledore says, like, people have, like, wasted away in front of it. Uh, Dumbledore actually explaining exactly why Ron is, is seeing that. Because he, because he doesn't feel overshadowed by anyone for once which must be a nice feeling for full wrong because he just does feel overshadowed a lot he, especially in fact especially when Ginny moves up uh as well so like she like overtakes him in, in, in a sense there's a wonderful line uh when uh when Dumbledore is there with Harry where uh Harry like says can I ask you something professor and I gotta say guys one of my one of my pet peeves in life and I don't mean Rick Mail's character but one of my pet peeves in life is people saying, "Can I ask you a question?" Just answer the, uh, just ask the question. Especially online, I like on my YouTube videos. I get, a, I'll get a comment like saying, "Can I ask you a question?" And then not ask the question straight away afterwards. So I had to then say, "Yeah, sure." Wait a few hours and then get the question. Just, just ask the question. <laughs> this is when I'm gonna get loads of comments in the, in, in, on this video saying, "Can I ask you a question, Veggie?" Well, go ahead if you want to, guys. Um. And yes, uh, Harry actually asks what Dumbledore would have seen in the mirror. I don't remember that being in the movie. But again, guys, it has been a while since I've seen um, Philosopher's Stone. Uh, and Dumbledore like, says uh, him holding some thick socks. Because people always get him books for, his, uh, for Christmas and everything. But you'd actually love some thick socks. Which is wonderful. But Harry does speculate that he could actually be lying. Which again, adds that mystery to Dumbledore. Which... It's very interesting because this is the first scene in the books and in the movies where Harry and Dumbledore actually speak with each other. I'm pretty certain of that. Um, and yeah, we have this mystery. Even even Harry's like saying he's probably lying. And he probably is, guys. Um, hopefully we'll find out more about what... I guess in the future books and maybe in Fantastic Beasts, which apparently is a prequel, we could potentially speculate what he really saw in the mirror. But obviously, I can't cover that yet. Though we need to watch, uh, we need to watch those movies. And quite frankly, some people have said that we need to get the book reviews out the way before doing Fantastic Beasts, guys. I don't know if I can uh, keep you waiting that long, seriously. But we'll discuss it, guys. We got plenty of other things to cover on the channel in the meantime. But that is my notes for Chapter Twelve. 
let's move, move over to the Harry Potter book club. I need like a little thing to appear on screen going, yay, at this point. Okay, so moving over to the Patreon, guys. Like I say, you can be a part of this if you want to go and uh, back the Patreon. Don't feel like you have to, guys, but uh, you can you can pledge as little as you want and you can be a part of the future book clubs. Um, there are some rules around it with like trying to keep them short, trying to keep them on topic, um, trying to keep them to like a couple of sentences and everything. I have had to delete a couple of comments that have been made this time because they're referring to stuff which is in the future. I'm so sorry about that, guys. I just need to keep them on topic and so we can get through them. And we got a lot of them, guys. And so let's get through them. They're gonna be. It's gonna be a bit, a bit of a quick fire here, but uh, let's go. Start off with Jacob. I should say now. I'm so sorry about the, the way I pronounce some of these names. I'm dyslexic. I'm terrible at reading. I'm afraid. Uh, so Jacob uh, starts starts off with has it has anyone pointed out to you that er is it I don't know is desire backwards I gotta admit Jacob I don't think anyone's no mentioned that before if you have I apologize guys but quite frankly this message is how I learned this information I didn't notice that at all very good point uh, Paula uh, unlike unlike in the movie Ron did not need prompting. Or instructions from Hermione to take out the troll with the um, swish and flick. Um, he remembered the spell and remembered her lesson in how to properly say the spell, even if he wasn't happy with her doing so at the time. Exactly. So true, Paula. And I prefer that. It's definitely subtle. But it's important to remember that they did take out the troll as a team. And I guess it, 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 the movie makers may have been thinking we need to make it obvious that Hermione is a part of this as well. She really is, guys. Without Hermione, Ron wouldn't have been able to take out that troll. So that's a very, very good point. Paula also does say, uh, normally I would only cover one comment, but as, uh, that comment was relatively short. I will do too. But in future, if you could keep just one comment, uh, just so I can get through uh, more people, you know. Uh, once, one, once the three became friends, Hermione start, starts changing. A lit That little rule follower sets... A teacher on fire to save Harry, yes. And that never would have happened a few chapters ago. Absolutely. This is what I was saying about earlier on, how um, Hermione... The whole rule-following thing is not that clear in the movies. Maybe I'm wrong, guys. Maybe it is. But I don't, I, I don't remember thinking Hermione was particularly a rule-follower. But in the book, that seems to be her main trait. Before the fact that she's like, you know... Like, you know... Um, what's, what's the term? Like a... A SWAT, as some people would refer, refer to it. No, into a studying and everything. Annie says, Although it's exciting to watch Quidditch on screen, Harry not doing anything until the snitch flies past him in the movies annoys me. That and how the movie makes it seem like Quidditch has no rules or fouls whatsoever. That's true. So that foul didn't happen then. I'm glad that you can confirmed that, Annie, because I couldn't quite remember if that was. I didn't think it was. And it's true. There's like a bit where I can't... It may have been the bit where whoever is meant to be, um, Angelina Johnson maybe, gets like shoved you know, towards the pylon and, and hits it. And it just cuts to Harry like going... Like that. He's just, he's just floating there. So yeah, you're right. He should be looking around and obviously keeping aware of his surroundings. He should be watching the game as well. But yeah, he is just floating there. <laughs> uh, Digo, um, since you're listening to the audio book, you probably didn't notice the whole inscription on the mirror of Erezed can be read backwards, although the individual words are not broken up correctly and it reads i show not your face but your heart's desire oh my goodness that's interesting wow i mean that that's a pretty amazing detail there digo zeeth i think it's zeeth i think it would be better for critics for if the snitch only awarded 50 points instead of 50 150 also, in the movie, Wood originally tells Harry that if he catches the snitch, he wins the game. That's exactly what I was mentioning earlier on. Very true. That line completely threw me off. I think straight away after, I was like saying, what's the point of the rest of the game then? That isn't what he says in the book. He says that the team usually wins. Which confused a lot of first-time watchers before it later revealed that it, that it gives 150 points. Absolutely. Does, it not even, does he not even mention that it gives you 150 points at that point? Word. Oliver, I should say. Very interesting, Zeef. I'm so sorry if I'm saying your, your, your name wrong, but... 
Yeah, that is a confusing line. Uh, Virginia, the mirror of Erezed is my favorite chapter in the book. It is very good. It's just so sad that his greatest desire is his family. Also, one of my favorite bits, uh, but from that moment on, Hermione Granger became their friend. There are something... Yes, uh, this, is, this is it. This is the, the line which I said. That is such a sweet line, isn't it? Knocking out a 12-foot mountain troll is one of them. That is one of my favorite lines from this book already. Possibly my favorite line. It's got to be my favorite line. I thought that was charming, in fact. Um, Melina, or Melina, I'm so sorry about my pronunciations and the names. I, th I like how in the book, Ron's reaction makes it clear how rare and special the invisibility cloak is. The way he reacts in the movie makes him seem like they're really common. That's very true, and they also make him out to be an idiot. Because like I say, Harry puts it on, looks down, is like... And then Ron says, Blimey, Harry, it's an invisibility cloak. Yeah, well done. In fact, I think, I think that was actually my reaction in, in, the, in, in, the, in the movie reaction. But yeah, he realised it, it before Harry's even tried it on. So I completely agree. It does put over how special it is. Uh, Becky, uh, in chapter 12, when it said Ron grunted in his sleep, I snorted because to me, Ron will always be called Grunt now. Grunt by name, Grunt by nature, stay awesome. It was Becky's comment that I saw. I must have got like an email about a notification. I just like glanced at it and it, and it said, uh, yeah, Ron grunted in his sleep. So because of that, I was listening out for it. If it hadn't been for this comment, I wouldn't have picked up on that at all. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Stay awesome. You too, Becky. Uh, no profile name. I'm guessing is your real name. Um, one of my favorite things from chapter 12 is... The Weasley's bewitching snowballs hitting Quirrell in the back of, uh, of the turban. I didn't even make a note of that. Or I guess you could say right off Voldemort's face. Oh my goodness. You know what, guys? I did note that. And that was the first time I thought, oh, I don't really like that. The 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 twins are doing that. Because I love the twins, guys. And obviously they are mischievous. But it's obvious. Okay, I say obvious. To... To, you, to, to everyone in the school, that Quirrell is this very, very nervous guy. And I do think that's kind of horrible to do that to someone like that. Do it to Snape, sure. But, you know, but uh, the fact that it's Voldemort's face, that's... I didn't think that for a, a slim second. Lily. A lovely Jordan. Very biased, absolutely. Commentary in the Quidditch match and McGonagall's reactions to it. Also think Stephen Fry would oh uh, make a great Dumbledore now that he's older. Very true. He's got the whimsy and the warmth. Very true. I completely agree with that, Lily. And I thought you were going to say how Stephen Fry's version, Stephen Fry's version in in the audiobooks is hilarious of Lee Jordan's. It, the fact that how quickly he's jumping into between Lee Jordan, Lee Jordan and McGonagall reprimanding him is actually hilarious. I do say Jim Dale's is easier to follow. But Stephen Fry is talking at such a speed, you don't really understand what's going on with, with, with the game as well. But you definitely pick up on the hilarity of Lee Jordan being blatantly biased. And we're going to go trying to keep him in line. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, Gary. I always wondered why Hermione didn't tell Professor McGonagall the truth about the troll. Not being at the feast because she was upset is surely better than attempting to go after the troll herself and she still could have explained that Harry and Ron came to rescue her. I, I'm wondering if it's that I, it's distancing herself from Ron and Harry because there's a chance that McGonagall wouldn't have believed the whole be being in, being away from the festival, being in the bathroom. Um, and she really wanted to put Harry and Ron on a pedestal. I guess she want. Okay, okay. I, I, I guess what it is, is that McGonagall was clearly reprimanding Harry and Ron. And and Hermione wanted to flip that. She, wa she wanted to take any responsibility away from uh, Harry and Ron and put all the blame on her. Now, her being in the bathroom uh, during the feast, not much blame there. But if you say that you were going to do it on your own, that's going to take the blame off those two. So maybe that's the difference. But yeah, interesting, Gary. I hadn't even thought about that for a second. That's a very interesting point. Uh, Maria, this might be way too personal, but have you ever contemplated what you would see in the mirror? 
Uh, for me, it would probably be animals living their best lives in a vegan world. How oh, lovely. <laughs> also, I can tell JK isn't big on sports considering how OP she makes the Seeker. I have heard that before, how people say that it's, it's written as someone who isn't that into sports. It's the sort of game which someone would write who isn't that into sports. Which I think could be solved by getting either points or end up ending the match upon catching the snitch. It's uh, as opposed to both. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It is a strange old sport. And that's why I want to play the video game. Because I don't think it would make that much sense as a video game. Because how do you differentiate between... I mean, do you have to play the Seeker in a video game? I, I, I don't know if there's a, a multiplayer on, on, on teams or anything. But yeah, that's very true. As for what I would see in the mirror... I don't know, guys. Because it can be ambition and things, can't it? And so it could be me hitting 100,000 subscribers, which has always been my goal on YouTube, guys. And we are, we are getting up there now. We're over 80,000 subscribers on the channel. Um, which is phenomenal. Thank you all so much. But I do think mine might be a bit like Harry. I think it would be past pets, to be honest. I think it would, guys. Like, past dogs and, like, rabbits and um, uh, that, that I've had. Particularly, like, a, well, a couple of years ago, before I got Woozle, who's my current uh, girl. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I lost a, a pet, which was very special to me, called Penny. She was a Labrador Collie, and she meant the absolute world to me. <laughs> I would definitely see her in the mirror, I'm afraid. But, you know, I, I then uh, took on Woozle. She was a blue... Penny was a Blue Cross... Um, uh, a, 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 a shelter... Pet, I should say she was uh, she was mistreated not as badly as Woozle. Woozle was actually really badly treated um very badly treated um and so they needed someone with experience uh, looking after dogs with a, a, a bad backgrounds and Penny did have that as well and so now I, I look after Woozle. Thank you very much for your question Maria I'm sorry for getting emotional <laughs> uh, Amanda what are your thoughts on Fred and George throwing enchanted snowballs at Professor Krill and bouncing off the back of his turban now that you know that Voldemort is at the back of his head? That's so true. I didn't even think about that for a second. I should have done thinking about it. You know, considering I watched the movies, but I didn't give that a second sport though. That's hilarious, Amanda. We need that scene in the movie. And like the back of the turban like saying, screw you guys or something. From Lily is also I love how Ron and Hermione are like an old married couple from getting uh, from the get go. Don't nag, yes, absolutely. And how Harry consoles Neville and gives him a little pep talk, absolutely. That's very true, especially in the charms class. It's absolutely adorable. Uh, with uh, Ron and Hermione, they really don't like each other, and and Harry doesn't like uh, Hermione at this point either, which really doesn't come off in the movie. It does feel like Ron really has it in from Hermione, but Harry is just floating through the situation. Again, this is what I'm saying about with, with, with Draco. With Draco, is that we really find out that Harry's negative thoughts, and we hear negative thoughts about Hermione as well. So, very different. It is definitely very different. Georgina, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, I think it's one of my first, uh, one of the first big indicators of Ron's character with what he sees in the mirror. It helps set a backdrop for the choices he makes in the Goblet, uh, in Goblet and Deathly Hallows. Very interesting. The real insecurity he has about being overshadowed and how all he really wants is to be respected and admired, which isn't a bad thing at all. To outclass his friends and family, prove himself to himself, yeah. And how that ties back to his family dynamic. Very interesting. It really is interesting, Georgina. And I, I didn't really pick up on that in, in the movies until... Well, certainly not in the first couple of movies. But it's... It, that is... I really like the way that Ron's mirror vision was written in the book. Loving the hat. I love Lee Jordan's commentary in the books. You really to tell that he's Fred and George's friend. That's true. I wish that they showed his personality like that in the movies. Also, I like how both teams were getting at each other rather than the movies where Slivering are just cheating with, with no punishments. That's very true. 
that's very true. I guess it might be a time thing where they just, you know, in the movie they need to establish who the good guys and who the bad guys are. But in a school dynamic, it really shouldn't be black, that black and white, guys. That's, you know, that's not what it's like at school. It's like there, there are, you know... So, yeah, it, it, it's true. And Lee Jordan, I mean, he only, he only really had one time to shine. I'm pretty sure that we do see him in the in uh, the platform nine and three quarters at, on, on the first movie. And then he's commentating. And then after that, he's kind of like, I'm sure he's in the background sometimes, but he's kind of done after that. He is, he was brilliant, particularly in, in the book um, during this moment. Uh, Zulahan. So say if I'm sorry, so so sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Is it just me or is it Hogwarts unreasonably huge? I mean, there are f fewer than fifteen classes, each having its own classroom, and there are a few more places we get introduced to, like common rooms and so on. Yes, but what other rooms or special places do do you think Hogwarts could have within its seven floors, dungeons and dozens of towers? Very interesting, Zulu. I guess that really depends on why Hogwarts was built. Why the building was built, I should say. Was it actually built as a school? Or was it like a a, 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 a castle beforehand which then got taken in by wizards? No, I think it was actually built by the wizards, wasn't it? It was built by the four houses. So I don't know. Obviously, you have like the, the living quarters for the teachers as well because they live there like permanently, don't they? Very interesting question, Zulahan. I'd like to see uh, any, uh, any any other opinions on that. But yeah, there seem to be a lot of mysteries built into this place. Maybe, I mean, we know that Filch has like his own network of getting around the, these places, but obviously like, the, the, the Chamber of Secrets was built by Sliverings for Sliverings. Maybe there's other rooms for, you know, for Hufflepuff, which are, and, and so on, are just aren't known about. Uh, and yet, after Dumbledore explains to Harry why Ron sees what he sees in the mirror, think about the depth of character it takes for Ron to be the best friends, be best friends with Harry, who is the most famous kid in the world. That's actually very true. That's actually very true. Yeah, because Ron is like always talking about how he feels in the shade of of his family and everything. Well, he's also in the shade of Harry. Hence, why what what he sees in part two, uh, part one of Deathly Hallows. Very interesting point. Uh, Bernie, um, I love when Harry gets to throw mess back at Malfoy's face, especially about his broom. Ah, yes! it's And it's really thanks to Malfoy here that I've got it. Chef's kiss. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yes, that's very true. You don't get that in the movies. You don't get that side of Harry. He is, he can be a sarky guy. Uh, Henry, um, I really wish there was more of Oliver Wood and Quidditch in general in the movies. Yeah, I thought, I actually going into the into the movies, I thought that Quidditch was actually going to be a recurring thing. I thought the first movie was going to end with a big Quidditch match. Obviously, I was wrong there. But yeah, more Oliver Wood been in, would, would have been good, ironically. He was an older student though, so he wouldn't have been in all of them. I mean, I guess, I guess he could have come back for the, for the battle at the end. Uh, Zachary, whilst Alan Rickman is a great actor and did a great job with Snape, the main issue I have with him is his age. He, he, I, I suppose he's supposed to be the same age as Harry's parents who died when they were 21 years old. So in the books, he's only in his early 30s. Yeah. That's true. I'm wondering why Alan Rickman was cast. Um, I don't know if that's anything to do with the author, maybe saying that, that that he would be perfect for it despite his age. But I mean, they have used makeup and so on to make him look a bit younger. They certainly did in Deathly Hallows Part Two. But um, but yeah, you're right. There is an age discrep discrepancy there. Is it Anya? I'm so sorry about uh, the way I pronounce the, these names. I love the fact that uh, Mrs. Weasley's took time to knit up not only her children some s seasonal sweaters, but also Harry. That is so sweet, isn't it? Simply because Ron stated that he might not get anything for Christmas. An absolute sweet and heartfelt gesture that I feel gets overlooked a little bit. Because it's something that happens only for a moment and from someone that is ne isn't necessarily in the scene we uh, with the current characters i completely agree it is adorable in fact i think it's at the start of um uh prisoner of azkaban where i like, say can't the weasleys just adopt harry because seriously they, they clearly are such kind parents 
they, they they treat him like a child, like like one of their children, I should say, when he's around. It's very very sweet. In fact, according to Jordan Fred, they treat him better because they like say his his jumper is better than theirs and everything. Uh, Kirsten, Dumbledore knew Harry was sneaking around at night, maybe even knowing they were looking up Nicholas Fermel as well, and didn't stop them showing shows he wanted them to figure everything out. Also, what critch position do you would you play as if you could? It's very interesting about Dumbledore. I do feel like he especially i think as a, even in this in the movies you do feel at the end he's like dumbledore has kind of not orchestrated it but he's made sure that all the pieces are in, in the right place so yeah i completely agree with that as when it comes to the position i think i might have a go at the keeper to be honest i think i'd have a go at the keeper three holes does, does the back of the hole count though that's the question because obviously the pitch goes round like it like in, in an ice hockey can you throw the ball through the back of the hole interesting question uh, I guess I'd be answered in the video games. Uh, Jonas, um, Quidditch in the movie portrayed as a very physical sport with the ref basically doing nothing. That always bugged me. In the books, Madame Hooch actually caused many fouls. Can't wait to hear your thoughts about those chapters. Yeah, very true. This is like the, going on the comment earlier on how I guess their shorter time they need to establish people as being the bad guys in a situation so they made them all rough and tumble and let let them get away with it maybe yeah it's true they don't get reprimanded and obviously we're gonna have future quidditch matches in, in the future i'll be interested to see how those go as well uh sarah she hermione didn't even stop to say uh, sorry as she knocked uh, Professor Quill head first into the own front. Yes, that's such a great line. Such a quick throwaway line that means so much when you look back. Hermione did actually save Harry's life by stopping the teacher j jinxing his broom. It just wasn't the teacher she was actually s specifically uh, s suspecting and targeting, nor the way she planned to do it. Now I think about it. Yeah, if she hadn't locked into Quill, she probably would have killed Harry because she would have stopped Snape from doing the 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 counter curse yeah and i do prefer it in, in the book because like i say guys if you go back and watch the movie that scene you can clearly clearly see krill's like like really intense up at harry but you only know that after re-watching it whereas in the book that is so subtle you're still not even 100 percent sure if it, I, I i do like the way that is that line the fact that she just she that she didn't stop to say uh, to apologize when she knocked krill over that was a really like, i really appreciated the way that was done uh, Bernie again writes, I hate that the significance of the invisibility cloak is just glanced over in the movies. It's just a line on a note that it belongs to it belonged to his father. This is the first thing we we know of. Harry possesses that belongs to one of his parents. That's so true. And for him to, for him it's, it's personal. It seems by him choosing to use it alone for the first time to explore the castle exactly what i say he's been so desperate his whole life for a personal connection to his family now he's in, in this place with this thing and he never felt cl closer to them he's never felt closer to them i think it's beautiful that it leads him to find the mirror and yes yeah, very true and starts him on his hero's journey not to mention the memory he calls upon when he first makes progress with the Patronus. Absolutely. Yes, very true. It all starts with his father's cloak. That's so true, Bernie. I guess... Yeah, because Christmas Day in the movie is just kind of like... There's no thought... There's no moment where we're left with Harry thinking, Wow, this is actually my father's property and everything. Very true. Very, that is something which was kind of skipped over in, in the movies. Uh, Cora. This part, f few these past few chapters really show us the main character's flaws. In the Midnight Duel, we see Harry's rash, rash, rashness in agreeing to fight Malfoy so easily. Absolutely. We see Hermione's snobby sort of need to be right all the time and nag others absolutely and ron's poor self-image uh, or insecurity but what's good about it is it lets us see their growth in the story processes the movie sorts of glosses over some of the traits which 
unfortunately lowers the impact of their growth and development. I could not agree more, Cora, particularly with Harry, because like I say, I didn't really feel like he had any faults in in the first movie per se. Hermione's faults being different about her being the rule break, uh, uh, sticking to the rules and so on, and Ron's insecurity. I couldn't agree more. It, it really adds more to them. And I do feel like characters with faults are always the most interesting, guys. That's why I love Persona 4 out of all the Persona games. The fact that it's all about characters' faults and overcoming them. I think that that is such an important bit of character building that you have a character who's just right all the time and is always just perfect. It's, no, it's never going to be as interesting as a character who's trying to overcome their, their, their struggles to be a better person. So, yeah, I completely agree with that, Cora. Uh, love good. I love that you see more of the side characters, roommates, uh, Quidditch players, Lee Jordan, who was so much fun, absolutely, and that the trio has more character. Harry, a, a funny side. It shows Ron ha is smarter than portrayed in the movies and Hermione is more human. I completely agree. I remember even on my first reactions to the movies, people were saying that Ron was done better in the books and he's, he's certainly done differently. Uh, I do think probably better as well. Uh, the Mirror is probably my favourite chapter in the book, just like the uh, pre earlier comments. It shows so much of Harry and Ron's motivations. It also tr interesting that Dumbledore um, loaned the cloak from James, knowing how now what you know about the Deathly Hollows. Oh, interesting. Harry feels like part of his family for the very first time. It's like, oh, I can't just say just now. Celebrating with uh, the Weasley brothers. I think Percy in the books is really interesting character as well. In in the movies, he's barely in the, there. I agree. I mean, George and Fred are, are... I think they're great in the movies, but they are done better in the books. But Percy... There's no two, quite, two ways about it, guys. Percy is done much better in the books. He really was left out in... in um, in the movies, if that's because they had a lot of characters to cover already, maybe, but he's a lot better in the books. He really is. Uh, Ambitur, is it? I'm so sorry. Oh, this is the last one. I'm so sorry about reading your name wrong. I absolutely can't wait until you get to the later books. Numerous questions that you've been asking through your reactions are answered in great detail for, throughout the books. I can only imagine how many... Epiphany. There we go. I'm sorry, guys, my reading moments you're bound to have as you progress through them it takes it's taken a lot of willpower to not just blurt them out answers and your questions that much appreciated so that you can properly experience this mind melt the mind melts that i had when i first read the series after watching the movies you're easily being oh don't say this you're thank you very much you're easily being the best reactor to watch the these series in my opinion i sh showed it the most love and the fan base appreciates that i can tell you thank you so much that's so so uh so so sweet of you at the end i haven't seen anyone else what react to these movies obviously i couldn't do before finishing um my own reactions but that's really kind of you i do love reaction movie uh videos guys and so that's why i decided to do my own on movies which i haven't seen but that's so kind of you and yes i'm already learning so much more about these characters and the scenes and like Hogwarts in general and everything just from doing the chapters that we've done guys uh this is the fourth video uh of the series the next two will wrap up this book uh I can't believe we're already need for the first book but that's really really kind of you I really do appreciate comments like this guys this is one reason why I keep the Patreon as cheap as possible because I really love hearing you guys' feedback and I want you to be a part of the videos as well and so Thank you so much. That was really, really sweet. This is probably a long book club section, guys. I did ask at the end of the last one, should I make it a separate video? I'm not sure. I'll do it all in one again this time, and then we'll decide if we want to make it a, a separate video in the future. But i got to leave it there because this has been a very long one. Looking forward to the next few chapters, guys. And I'll see you there. And if you're on the Patreon, keep an eye out for these posts and be a part of the video as well. If you could follow these rules, though, because there were some multiple comments. And um, and like I said, there was one comment which wasn't like uh, completely about these chapters. I do need to try and keep them focused just so we can get through them uh, more smoothly. Either way, 
Thank you all so much for making your comments, though. Seriously, you're, every single one of you appreciate, even the ones which I had to get rid of. I'm so sorry about that, but I just had to do it just so we could uh, keep things focused. But love every single one of you. Please like, comment, subscribe, all the good stuff. I'm Video Gamer. I'll see you next time.